Hi, thanks. So th this is new. Uh, I want to thank the people, folks who organized this. It's a wonderful conference. And this is some new material for me, and it's just written, uh, re it's just hot off the presses, so I'll be venturing into moral theory and so on, where I'll be happy to have other people who know more than I do um, assess its plausibility. So, um, in his preface to Science and Metaphysics, Sellers remarked on, quote, the astonishing extent to which in ethics, as well as in epistemology and metaphysics, the fundamental themes of Kant's philosophy contain the truth of the variations we now hear on every side. And I think Sellers' uh, 1970 presidential address to the Eastern Division APA, which borrowed its title from the uh, phrase of Kant's paralogisms, this I or he or it, the thing which thinks, uh, I think that was an astonishing piece of work itself. Um, in its compact 25 pages, Sellers managed to sketch novel yet plausible reconstructions of central aspects of Kant's view, uh, views on self-knowledge, on persons, freedom and morality, all along the way suggesting how all of those uh, modified Kantian views could plausibly be rendered consistent with a naturalist ontology. In this paper, I want to focus on Seller's APA address as an occasion for further reflection on the insights of Kant and Sellers on, on how best to conceive the nature of and relationships between our thinking selves, our practical agency, and our natural embodiment. So it'll be a speculative kind of um, synoptic talk. So this is part one. On Sellers' view, what most fundamentally unites the theoretical domain of our cognition of objects and the practical domain of freedom and morality is our capacity for thought, um, and in particular thought as governed by various norms of reasoning. Both sense perception and volition, volition for example, were fundamentally species of conceptual thinking for Sellers. As he put it in his 1967 Lindley lectures on ethical theory, quote, the focal point of practical reasoning is action as the focal point of empirical reasoning is observation. Perceptual takings or judgments are the thoughts which typically arise from the impact of the world on our mind through, sensory, through our sensory capacities, and volitions are the thoughts which typically impinge on the world through our motor capacities. And that's very important for him, I think, when we get to mentioning some of his views in moral theory. Um, you grow up learning to respond with there's a chair in, in the presence of a chair, and, and so perception is a causal cum conceptual process. You also grow up, I mean, if someone's staying in your house and learning English as a second language and the phone rings and, and they say, I'll get it, and, but they stay on the couch and you miss the call, and it rings again, and they say, I'll get it, stay on the couch, you miss, then you say, look, when you say I'll do A, it's generally followed by the doing of A. <laughs> so for, for sellers, uh, in now we're going to see that intentions can be thought of as practical commitments and volitions can be, can be thought of as intentions or practical, commi practical commitments to do something here and now and hence as a special case of commitments to do something at some time or other. So intentions are thoughts that are by their very nature uh, efficacious because they lead to actions and so they're in a sense motivating by their nature and this will fund a kind of internalism for sellers. Okay. Now, in the APA article accordingly, Sellers focuses on the nature of our thinking across both the practical and theoretical domains, and the lead question of the article is the same as Kant's in the paralogisms. What is the nature of our thinking being, or as Sellers puts it, of an I or of this I, quote, meaning roughly whatever can be for referred to by an appropriate tokening of I. He then proceeds to defend both um, Kant's epistemic account of the a priori unity of the eye as a necessary condition for the possibility of experience, and also Kant's diagnosis of the fallacies involved in traditional metaphysical accounts of the nature of a thinking being um, as the subject of a putative rational psychology. So in this talk, I want to focus on some of the ways in which the Kant seller's view of the I think relates to these wider issues of freedom, morality, and nature which I haven't said much about before elsewhere, um, that Sellers discusses in the rest of the APA article. And along the way, I'll argue for some slight modifications to the views of Kant and Sellers, 
so that in the end, a, a sort of Kantian naturalist outlook is supposed to emerge as plausible, at least in, in broad strokes. Now, the most abstract but also the most fundamental unity of the thinking sel self for Kant and Sellers is what might be called a thought unity, a conceptually represented uni unity, but the unity of a form of representation rather than the representation of the self as a unified thing or object or substance, whether material or immaterial. Kant's arguments for this are familiar but controversial. They start out, for example, with the distinction between manifolds or successions of thoughts or experiences taking place in a consciousness in contrast with the thought or experience of such manifolds or successions as such in a judgment or, or a rule of inference. The latter sorts of thought unities or judgments or inferences uh, or conceptual rules are argued to be necessary for the possibility of any potentially self-aware experience. Not that you're self-aware all the time, but having the capacities to make those distinctions are part of what it is to have the capacity to be aware of your self as having experiences and thoughts. On this Kant Seller's view, a thinking self is, at least with respect to this first most abstract necessary condition, is, is itself an achievement or represent, uh, of representation or thought. On, these, on this view, it just is in thinking in accordance with the rule-governed conceptual distinctions and experience-informed inferential patterns that implicitly distinguish a generally lawful world of objects from one's own perspectival experiences of them that we thereby implicitly represent ourselves as experiences, experiencers of that world at least in this most abstract, necessary condition kind of way. Now, if we can suppose, at least for present purposes, that something like this is true, then what Sellers rightly goes on to stress, I think, in a way that a lot of Kant scholars weren't, at the, this is 1970, um, he emphasizes what this view does not entail, um, what it leaves open. And I want to contrast this with sort of general disembodiment style or dualist objections to Kant, which always have something to them, but I think um, Sellers does a better job than some of those standard objections. Um, and uh, these objections occur both in the theoretical philosophy, the I think is disembodied and so on, and it occurs in practical philosophy as well with regard to the pure will. Okay. And of course Kant exacerbates it with language or possibly positions that seem to assert the non-spatio-temporal nature of the self and of the will and so on. So I, I want to take the sting out of some of these things. I think Sellers attempts to take the sting out of some of these positions. Okay. The present case, case of the nature of the thinking self is a particularly difficult one to sort out in this respect. Sellers begins by analyzing Kant's view of the I in the paralogisms as supporting three main claims. One of the things, by the way, that I think I'm going to show Sellers does is that um, some things that I think is true of Kant and gets... Uh, Bob Brandom does something in his book on um, the, dead, the great dead philosophers about how you often have to read back later stuff to make sense what, of what occurs earlier in the works, and I think um, in Kant, his method is to articulate at the most abstract level certain necessary conditions, but then there are nested necessary conditions that have to do with the empirical and the embodied, with happiness and with your natural desires. And people, you know, he writes these in other works and later, and you forget that the first things weren't supposed to be sufficient conditions for an abstract thing. They're supposed to specify most abstract necessary conditions that then get embodied. That's the idea. Okay. Now. So Sellers sums up these three claims in the paralogisms this way. The I is a being of unknown species, an unknown kind, uh, which thinks. The I doesn't simply have thoughts, it thinks. But in knowing that it thinks, that it thinks, and what it thinks, we are not knowing what sort of being it is. These are two claims in the paralogisms. And thirdly, the I must have a nature but what it is we cannot know, though we can know uh, that it's not material substance. And Sellers is going to uh, finesse that third claim a bit. Sellers explains Kant's claims roughly as follows. What we know a priori is the I as a form of thought unity in the way I've explained. 
We cannot, by contrast, know a priori the nature of the I as a thing or object, that is, as the ultimate subject of our thoughts in that sense of ultimate subject. Kant's further claim that we can, however, know that the nature of the I is not material pertains to matter conceived as the movable in space or res extensa um, in space and time. The ground of this further claim that we can know that the self is not material, Seller says, is not because on Kant's view we have any positive, let alone adequate idea of mind as a sort of being. Rather, it's because our <coughs> empirical knowledge of the self finds no space, so to speak, in the primary qualities of matter for our inner mental states as we're aware of them in introspective awareness or inner sense on Kant's view. In the background in this respect is Kant's general Galilean view that the secondary sensible qualities of, of color as experienced, for example, must have their empirical home somehow in the, in the experiencer. This is in the empirical sense that the Kant uh, goes with Locke and Descartes on, on putting sensible colors, and so he's not interested in color at all. Okay. Now, I think then Kant himself is a kind of inner outer empirical dualist, an empirical state dualist of the inner and outer, and I think this is what Sellers is diagnosing, but not because we have any positive idea of what a mind is per se, Rather, we know only the represented unity in our thinking that's achieved by our thoughts in the, in the way that I explained. So Sellers begins to bring out the revision that he wants to make in this case, and, and this is one element of truth in the disembodiment objections, I think, by pointing out certain ontological possibilities that Kant in the paralogisms recognized as at least thinkable, pertaining to noumena, as it were, um, and Sellers wants to take from this the point that it's at least coherently thinkable that the mind might not turn out to be in itself an ultimate logical subject at all, but rather an aspect of an ultimate subject, and we could call this overall subject the person. This is, for example, at A359. I don't have that text quoted from Kant. It's a Spinozistic sort of thought experiment. On this view, the, the person would be the ground or the possessor of both mental capacities and material attributes, and Kant plays with these thoughts as possible uh, in, the, in the paralogisms. Kant's paralogisms also contain certain thought experiments whereby such an ultimate logical subject could thinkably be in itself either a substantial unity in that way or an ultimate plurality of substances with memories passed on from one substance to another, you know, the, in the footnote in the, in the paralogism where, where Kant discusses that. But Seller's main point here is this one. Kant held that the thinking self or the I is knowable primarily only as a set of capacities of various kinds, and for Kant we must remain agnostic about the ultimate ground or realization of these capacities. What Sellers is suggesting at this point is easily must misunderstood. I think secondary comic dictators like Amrix and others, they quote Sellers as attributing to Kant a materialist kind of functionalism, or that his view easily fits a materialist functionalism, which isn't what Sellers was doing. What Sellers is, uh, his argument is that Kant's own view of the thinking self in the specific respects just noted has shown why it's intelligible for us to reject Kant's empirical dualism of the inner and the outer, the inner mental and outer material, while nonetheless maintaining Kant's conception of the thought unity of the thinking self in that more abstract, intentionally represented way, that you represent a self in, ver in the same way by representing a world that's independent of you. We can then intelligibly defend a view, which Kant himself did not hold, Sellers thinks, of our knowable empirical selves as fully materially embodied Strassonian persons exercising various ment mental abilities and possessing various physical attributes. So he's kind of saying, I'm going to defend Kant on the I think and the way, the sort of unity that's represented there. I'm going to reject uh, Kant's uh, empirical dualism of the kind of inner non-spatial and outer spatial. Kant has certain thoughts in the paralogisms that say the self in itself could turn out to be a subject having both mental and 
physical capacities. And Seller says, what, what I'm going to defend there if for is a Strassonian view like that, and that has within it the, kind of the irreducibility of the I think as well. So Sellers puts it this way. For what Kant has argued, this isn't a quote, as it is at least thinkable is that a logical subject which is necessarily not represented as an aspect of something more basic. That's the paralogisms. We do not represent ourselves as just an aspect of something more basic. Could nonetheless turn out to be, quote from Sellers, identical with the being which, as having material attributes, is the body, unquote. So you don't represent yourself as something material, but it could turn out that the same thing which is yourself is a fully material thing, the body, with mental capacities. Sellers' over-subtle dialectical qualifications in the APA paper seem to have led some commentators to think that Sellers was basically attributing a materialist functionalism to Kant, but he wasn't. He was saying with these slight modifications, we can embrace Kant's view of the I think and a Strassonian view of persons and have a materialist, a full materialist uh, account of, of, of its embodiment. Okay, and I think that's interesting stuff. From this perspective, we can agree with Kant's famous argument in the refutation of idealism while rejecting Kant's own empirical dualism. That is, uh, well, let me see. That is, we can agree that the cognition of the temporal ordering of our own mental states, knowing your own inner mental states, uh, depends upon a prior background involving the direct cognition of material objects, that you know the inner only in virtue of knowing the outer prim primarily. We can retain that view while reject rejecting this empirical dualism. But what Sellers notes now is that given Kant's view of the nature of the world of appearances in space and time, and here's the shift to a new topic, presumably even these reconstructed Strassonian persons, um, just as much as Kant's own domain of inner sense, quote, would be appearances belonging to a deterministic natural order, unquote, from Sellers on Kant. For all of the states of the empirical self for Kant, both inner and outer, Sellers continues, quote, belong to a deterministic system of events, the core of which consists of material events occurring to interacting material substances, unquote. So he makes these first fancy moves that, that have the irreducible Kantian thinking self fully embodied. We've got everything we want, but he says there's still a problem which is um, Kant's perspective is going to be that uh, all mental events are nonetheless fully determined, which Kant says in the, in the second critique. If you had sufficient insight into a mind, you could see that all thoughts are determined, Kant holds. And Sellers thinks the reason for this title, the, this I or think or the he or this I or he or it, the thing which thinks, is that, is that Kant is aware of this background of determinism and of the idea of a sort of automaton thinking thing or, or a thing that could be thinking but wouldn't really be a person in not having freedom and practical agency. He thinks that's in the background of what Kant's wrestling with. Okay. So the problem of determinism thus provides Sellers', Sellers quiet segue into the second half of the APA paper on topics concerning freedom and morality. And what eventually becomes clear by the end of the paper is that Sellers takes Kant's reference to it, the thing which thinks, to be a hint that all of the preceding views about the irreducible yet materially embodied thinking self has not yet by itself given us the human person, properly speaking. Rather, by themselves, such theoretical considerations considered so far might conceivably only give us what Sellers calls, quote, an automaton spiritual or spirituale, I don't know how you pronounce it, cogitans, a thinking mechanism, unquote. Quote from Sellers, what's haunting Kant in this cryptic passage, that is, this I or he or it, the thing which thinks, is the concept of an automaton spirituale, a, a, a mind which conceptualizes, but only in response to challenges from without and in ways which, however var varied, realize set dispositions, unquote. I think people, not only some interpreters, take Sellers to attribute materialist functionalism as, as easily fit, fit into Kant's view, which he doesn't. They also think he attributes this theoretical automaton view to Kant's theoretical philosophy and then goes on to do other things. But I'm going to try to argue that's not what Kant's doing, that what Sellers is doing. He's not attributing to Kant 
the automaton view. And we have to see how it later gets embedded in the practical for Kant's reading of, for Seller's reading of Kant. Okay. With regard to it, the thing which thinks, Sellers refers us to Kant's statement in his later Metaphysics of Morals that a thing um, is that to which nothing can be imputed. And if we ourselves, fo I followed up the reference, then we find that Kant precedes that statement with, of thinghood with this one. A person, quote from Kant, is a subject whose actions can be imputed to him. Moral personality is therefore nothing other than the freedom of a rational being under moral laws, whereas psychological personality is merely the ability to be conscious of one's identity in different conditions of one's existence, unquote. And in roughly the second half of this APA talk then, uh, we find Sellers wrestling with the question of how practical reason and intentional action and hence freedom and morality are, are related to our embodied personality as thinkers or thought unities. So here in the practical as, as well as in the, uh, well, I've already mentioned that, so that's okay. Um, Sellers is not suggesting, for example, that Kant himself did conceive the unity of thought in the theoretical domain, domain in accordance with an automaton conception of theoretical thinking one that is characterized by what Sellers calls the merely relative spontaneity. Um, and um, this is a central concept in Sellers' explication, but it can make look, it look like he's attributing that to Kant in places where he's not, I think. And which would then be sharply contrasted with the genuine spontaneity or autonomy of transcendental freedom. There's some truth in that distinction between moral autonomy and the sort of spontaneity we have in cognition of objects, um, but not when it's reified in a way that leads people to think Sellers holds that theoretical cognition is merely relatively spontaneous and is, a th is an automaton. That's uh, what I think. Kant's method involves abstracting from embodied experiences and actions various formal principles of thought and freedom that are thereby revealed as having necessarily been operative within those embodied realities themselves without this reflective distinction entailing any real disembodiment or non-spatial temporal thinghood per se, whether known or unknown. And then, of course, I have to wrestle with transcendental transcendental idealism and the self as it is in itself, but let's leave that aside for the moment. What Sellers saw more clearly than most Kant commentators, I believe, is that not only embodiment but also a primacy accorded to practice and the practical and to purposiveness or purpose um, is implicit throughout the rarefied non-empirical atmosphere of each of Kant's three highly abstract critiques. On the theme of determinism, Sellers begins by commenting as follows on Kant's view of self-affection. That's the idea that in being aware of your own inner thoughts, you're, as it were, affected by yourself, and you know your inner self only as conceptualized, just like you know outer things only as conceptualized. I like to call that the inner and the outer are in the same boat for Kant, unlike the Cartesian tradition. So here's the quote. By Sellers, Kant grants that inner perception may be prepared for by an activity of searching. You're searching your own thoughts, Hume's when I look inside myself. A direction of intention in which the mind, of an attention in which the mind affects itself, just as perceptual response may occur in a context in which we are looking for something, seeking relevant observations, and so on. But why the direction of attention and relevance to what? Here, considerations of purpose enter in, and the first critique simply abstracts from the purposive aspects of conceptualization that's involved in experiential knowledge, which I, I th think Sellers is very insightful in this way. Now, it's clear, Sellers continues, that although the structure of the first critique highlights what I've called the relative spontaneity of the conceptualizing mind, that's why people think he's just bluntly attributing this to Kant, it clearly presupposes a larger context in which the mind is thinking to some purpose. Thus, reference to reason in its practical aspect is implicit throughout the critique, the first critique, but only in the dialectic after the constructive argument is over does it become explicit. And 
what I like about this is that's I was mentioning it before. That's how I read Kant's philosophy as a whole in both the theoretical and the practical philosophy as you typically have the critique of pure reason gives you the most abstract principles. They get realized, though, as further necessary conditions in the metaphysical principles of science, also realized in the regulative maxims of purposiveness and so on. And I think that's a big deal. Kant's second analogy doesn't make any sense unless you see the regulative principles that nature has to have an empirical systematicity, there have to be uniformities, as a further necessary condition on the possibility of experience. Because the, the only way the second analogy concerning the general causal principle is realized is in empirical causal laws. And so the regulative maxims say there have to be some empirical causal laws or other. That's what makes it regulative, not constitutive. But that there have to exist such empirical causal laws is an a priori transcendental truth. It's a further necessary condition on the possibility of experience. People say Kant has no theory of empirical concepts or of empirical, there's another charge of dualism, but this is another case where I see that they haven't read back what needs to be read back into the, okay. Now, and this leads Paul Geyers and other people to see radical shifts in Kant's view in places where, where I don't think there are and so on. So let me move on now to part two. What does happen in the second half of Seller's APA paper by way of making explicit the wider practical context that was left implicit in the above doctrines concerning our embodied conceptual thinking? We left off at the point where Sellers had noted that the states of the empirical self for Kant, both inner and outer, belong to a deterministic system. And here Sellers introduces his further modification of Kant's view concerning the empirical self. He suggests that Kant, like many other philosophers, implicitly assumes that if nature is indeed a deterministic system, it must follow from this that we're passively caused to be in whatever mental or physical states we are in. The picture, Sellers writes, quote, is that all natural objects are passive with respect to their states so that if they cause other things to change, they do so, so because they have in their turn been caused by other things to be in the state by virtue of which they are causes, unquote. By contrast, Sellers contends, and he argues for this elsewhere in his view of freedom, um, the past is not something with respect to which we are passive. And this is so even on the assumption that we and everything else are thoroughly ensconced within a closed deterministic physical system. This idea reflects Seller's own unique version, at least in this respect, of the familiar compatibilist contention, but people can correct me if I've got Sellers wrong on, on freedom and determinism, but he's got a version of the traditional compatibilist view at this level that um, only in certain kinds of relevant circumstances are we forced or compelled or caused that the notion of a cause itself isn't just the notion of determinism, it's of a, a specific intervention or change or relevant type of, of, of obstruction. And that's what our freedom is contrasted with in this compatibilist sense. But Sellers doesn't rest only with compatibilism, but this he diagnoses of, uh, 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 as one respect in which he wants to modify Kant's view, no fear of determinism, uh, rendering us merely passive in our thoughts and actions in this sense. Okay. So um, in our thinking, for example, and hence in our intentions, volitions, and actions, we're not entirely the playthings of nature, but also actively thinking, self-monitoring systems, as it were. Quote, pure apperception, right, Sellers, gives us a non-passive <coughs> awareness of the mind as active. Indeed, he continues, Kant insists again and again that the mind is aware of the unity and spontaneity of its acts of synthesis. But this isn't enough, is what's unique about Seller's article. It's not that which is still going to turn out to be mere relative spontaneity unless you bring in this further final practical notion of autonomy. That's where we're headed. Sellers does argue plausibly, however, that for Kant, the spontaneity of which we are thus aware in being actively thinking beings considered so far solely from the theoretical perspective in relation to inner and outer determined appearances, might for all that still be the merely relative spontaneity of a thinking mechanism. The, that's a quote from Sellers. Quote, a theoretical automaton spirituale, as Sellers puts it, 
He draws the familiar computer analogy at this point, and he suggests that in this sense, the mind spontaneously initiated logical searches in response to data, and given its own computational dispositions, would ultimately still be a form of passivity, so considered, um, quote, though not sheer passivity, that is, it would be complex, but it would still be not the sort of thing that would give us personhood in the sense that he's going to end up with. The relative spontaneity of pure apperception so considered would in this case remain, as Sellers puts it, using Kant's term, quote, another example of a cause, the causality of which is itself caused. It's only in the final quarter of the APA paper that Sellers comes to the properly practical domain, domain from which the earlier analysis of our self-conscious theoretical cognition has abstracted. This concluding analysis takes place in two typical Kantian steps, not surprisingly, first in relation to what would basically be a neo humean conception of heteronymous agency from Kant's perspective, and then finally in relation to autonomous agency or, quoting Sellers, acting for the sake of principle, unquote. Freedom in the deeper sense, this is a quote that Kant is seeking to explicate, unquote. All right, so I already quoted that. So firstly, Sellers explained this heteronymous agency. The relative spontaneous, relatively spo spontaneous freedom of choice or willkür, Sellers brings in Kant's notion of willkür at this point versus villa. Um, uh, the relatively spontaneous freedom of choice or willkür of, in this case, a heteronymous agent would essentially involve the agents combining various intentions and purposes or desires with factual information in a procedure that would generate alternative, quote, alternative courses of action, one or other of which, ratified by the appetitive faculty, would become the decided or chosen course of action, unquote. Within this picture would be typically uh, the traditional notion of a higher order practical premise of self-love or one's own happiness, to use the traditional outlook, reflecting the natural human desire or interest in promoting one's own happiness. Practical reason exclusively so conceived for Sellers, according to Sellers, would not have a principle that is peculiar or intrinsic to, him, to itself, as he puts it. Rather, our practical reason would serve in the above way the naturally implanted end of pursuing one's own happiness, for example, uh, in relation to one's other, quote, particular desires and aversions. By contrast, secondly, Sellers sort of cuts quickly to the chase scene and just bluntly formulates his own version of the practical premise that would be intri intrinsic to practical reason, but elsewhere in Science and Metaph Metaphysics, Chapter 7, he's worked to spell this out more carefully. And he takes this to be Kant's notion of pure practical reason, autonomous agency, and his reformulation is this. Let any of us persons do that in each circumstance which promotes our common good, unquote. Now, Sellers indicates that he won't quote, attempt to justify the ascription of exactly this premise to Kant, unquote, though he does remark that Kant's own fundamental law, moral law, is generic in character rather than purely formal. This is another respect in which Kant tries to combine Kant's moral theory with a kind of, um, with aspects of Humean and utilitarian views about happiness that in 1970 may have seemed absurd, seemed absurd to try to combine Kant's view with those sort of views of the pursuit of happiness and the common good. But Kant's scholarship, although I don't work primarily in the moral theory, has tended to emphasize over the last two decades precisely that sort of thing, our sort of naturally embodied virtue, our, uh, how the pursuit of happiness is crucial to Kant's moral theory, and so on. Okay, the case in this respect, in that respect, I think closely parallels the points I stressed earlier in relation to our necessarily embodied capacity for pure apperception as thinkers, as well as concerning the intended empirical realization of Kant's transcendental principles as you move from the first two critiques through the third critique, 
on natural purposes beyond to Kant's later writing. So anyway, I think Sellers, the way he talks about Kant's pure apperception as relating to our natural embodiment in the theoretical philosophy is nicely paralleled by the way he talks about the pure principle of practical reason as embedded within a framework in which we're seeking our happiness and the common good. These are, I don't think, they might have shocked people in 1970 as interpretations of Kant, but I don't think they would today. So in the presidential address, in my view, Seller's remarkable um, unheralded achievement at that time was to have articulated the most fundamental abstract principles of the first two critiques in just 25 pages in a way that, against the tide of Kant interpretation, correctly situated Kant's account of both cognition and freedom in relation to their intended naturally embodied realizations. Now, I'm not going to launch into a, a if, even if I could, an attempt to explicate um, Seller's account of, of, of the moral law or of moral theory in general, but I'll say a few things. Um, the moral point of view for Sellers consists most fundamentally in our capacity to have practically efficacious thoughts, the content of which, so practically efficacious in the sense I spelled out early, earlier, they're ultimately going to be certain forms of intention. The, the content of which, as generically expressed in the above, above principle, let any of us do this, um, is a shared intention or practical commitment that, crudely put, any of us persons act in ways that promote our common good. Now, this immediately raises a host of, of, of questions. Um, Yeah, it raises a host of questions concerning, firstly, the specification of the relevant we or community of persons. It can be a very, very difficult issue concerning this theory. Secondly, concerning the idea that, as Sellers claims, this practical premise, quote, constitutes a purpose which can be said to be implied by the very concept of a community of persons. So he thinks, let us promote the common good as part of what it is to have a community. Interesting idea, but it would it takes some more work to defend that. And thirdly, Sellers also recognizes that this compact generic reference within the Kantian practical premise to what in each circumstance, quote, promotes our common good would, would gloss over empirical realities and uncertain means ends reasonings of enormous complexity. So without ignoring the existence of those problems, however, the, the following is roughly what I think uh, is the core account of practical agent, agency that Sellers is envisioning. Um, for what would promote our common good, he simply says, let us call this condition alpha. Right? That's the condition of what would, in fact, promote our common In other places, he discusses a team of scientists investigating what sorts of means, ends, reasoning would, would lead to happiness, and so on. Let any of us persons do that which satisfies, satisfies condition alpha. From that premise, along with relevant information, practical reasoning would derive the, from particular volitional core conclusion, let me now do A. Let any of us do alpha as promoting our common good, so let me now do A. That's the attention, uh, as promoting the common good. Importantly, however, that I actually do A, Sellers points out, assumes not simply that I understand that implication, let any of us do alpha, so let me now do A, but also that I actually affirm the antecedent of that, let any of us do that which promotes our common good. And what Sellers has in mind here is, is that typically there'll be a conflicting premise of self-love or of benevolence or whatever the case may be in relation to human interests. And in cool hours, Sellers puts it, that's referring to Joseph Butler and also W.D. Falk probably, and I'm interested when I go to Pittsburgh this week to look at the archives because Sellers, there's a folder on W.D. Falk apparently, and so I wonder what that has. Um, since I'm interested in Falk and had studied with him. So in cool hours, we'll be confronted with two different thoughts, both of them practically efficacious, motivating thoughts, but which one you affirm in the circumstances isn't just given by your having these thoughts available to you. One of them is, let me now do A because let any of us, because let any of us do action satisfying alpha, what promotes our common good, although this implies not promoting my happiness by doing B. Right? That's to affirm the answer. This would be acting autonomously from the moral point of view, according to Sellers. 
i.e. choosing to do something for the reason that it's implied by the moral law, quote from Sellers. That is, as being what I ought to do. But that, in cool hours, will also be contemplating, let me now do B, because let me now promote my happiness, although this implies my not doing A, which is subsumable under the principle, let any of us do actions satisfying alpha. This is to choose Vilcure uh, from the personal point of view, whether from self-love as here, or from sympathy, or from whatever, whatever particular feeling or interest. The moral point of view is thus, a, this returns to, to where I started, is thus a form of thinking for sellers, an intrinsically motivating thought or efficacious intention that once affirmed is generic in its content as being a commitment that any of us persons perform certain kinds of action in certain kinds of circumstances. As Sellers puts it, quote, that practical reason is autonomous means that a choice is possible in which practical reason itself affirms the antecedent, that is, this premise, let any of us do what promotes the common good, rather than one's choice issuing solely from the, what would be the merely relative practical spontaneity that is ultimately, however complex, a ratification by one's inclinations or interests. It is our capacity to act autonomously, quote, for the sake of principle, Sellers concludes, that distinguishes us from what would otherwise, uh, this is a quote, distinguishes us from what would otherwise, without that capacity, be the exclusively heteronymous choices of an it, the thing which thinks. Actually, that last one's not a quote. I have it italicized. But. So note that Sellers has here quietly exploited Kant's distinction. I'm getting toward the end. How much time do I got left? Uh, how much? Plenty. Oh, good. Sellers has here quietly exploited Kant's distinction between willkür or freedom of choice as distinguished from an autonomous villa as the generic motivating intention to act from the moral point of view. Some had distinguished that before Sellers, but in 1970, that's yet another thing that he's doing in a sophisticated way, I think, that others weren't doing um, in general. Supposing we lacked an autonomous villa or an intrinsically practical reason, Sellers points out, that we would still exercise the relatively spontaneous but ultimately heteronymous power of appetite ratified choice as outlined above. We'd still have that capacity. But crucially, Seller's particular account explains how it is that even as the autonomous rational beings that we are, which for Sellers just means that we can have that thought that can be efficacious in the way that all intentions us. There's nothing mysterious about it. Sellers explains how it is that even as the autonomous rational beings that we are, capable of the generic practical premise motivating our actions, we must still always exercise choice in the sense of willkür as to the matter of which antecedent premise intention is implicitly or explicitly affirmed in the circumstances, i.e. that the premise of morality or that of self-love, benevolence, and so on. For Sellers, it's clear that it's not intrinsic to autonomous practical reason, but matter, rather a matter of free choice or willkür that one, in point of fact, affirms one rather than the other. More concretely, that the one motivating thought rather than the other moting, motivating thought, in point of fact, turns out to be efficacious in motivating one's action. Though Sellers doesn't mention it here, I think this can also help explain a familiar problem in Kant's scholarship about um, freely chosen evil actions in Kant, which can look to de descend you into the, to the d domain of deterministic feelings. But Sellers' account rescues free yet evil action on, in, in Kant's account. So Sellers closes his address, his address um, with these remarks on Sellers on Kant's transcendental idealism, Kant ends on an agnostic note. We are conscious in pure apperception of ourselves as autonomous, rash, autonomous rational beings. This, to me, is where you have to read back and say, see, he wasn't attributing the relativistic, the rel merely relative spontaneity of a theoretical autonomy to our theoretical cognition. Here's where you need to read back that in pure apperception we're aware not only of uh, that our theoretical cognition is embedded within this account of our practical and purposive autonomous agency. So we're conscious in pure apperception that we're con um, of ourselves as autonomous rational beings, beings 
which can act out of respect for principle, just in having that generic thought as an efficacious thought, but is not perhaps this consciousness an illusion, Kant worries. Kant claims to know, Sellers continues on philosophical grounds, that as objects of empirical knowledge we are not in autonomous beings. We cannot know, alas, on philosophical grounds that as noumena we are autonomous, and Kant therefore takes refuge in the claim that equally we cannot know on philosophical grounds that as noumena we are not autonomous." Unquote. So I'll just close with a couple of comments on some of these difficult issues. Um, first, I want to just make that point about, and I won't make it again, that the practical context of genuinely autonomous reason is to be read back into the earlier stuff in the article about the theoretical cognition. But I also want to just raise this issue. Second, it seems to me that there's a complex ostensible circularity implicit in Seller's account of the role of normative principles in our practical agency. And the situation, I think, clarifies an ostensible circularity that Sellers himself wrestles with in the epistemic domain when he's talking about general epistemic principles on the one hand and particular non-inferential justified judgments on the other hand. So the particular judgments like here's a chair, Sellers is going to justify it by appeal to general epistemic principles like perceptual reliability principles, but how are the general principles justified? Sellers says at some point you're going to, it looks like you're going to have to appeal to some particular observations or other. And in that case, I think Sellers breaks out of it in a certain complex way, where on the one hand, he appeals to, in the epistemic domain, says any knowledge of a world is going to require certain causal reliability principles. That's a kind of Kantian argument. But he also says we're going to need an evolutionary account of, to explain how we came to have conceptual capacities in the first place. That's the way to break out of the circle of principles justifying particular judgments in the epistemic domain. And here I suggest here, so what's the circle I'm pointing to here? The conception of normative oughts that Sellers has been working with throughout this discussion and in the APA paper um, rests on his account of we intentions, let any of us do so and so. And, but Sellers' account of intentions ultimately rests on his account of individual intentions and to make sense of those already requires a sort of normative inferentialism. So you have, uh, he's accounting for normative principles as we intentions, which are grounded in I intentions, let any of us do so and so, but what it is to be an intention all are already requires embedding in a, in a, in a community, in, in a normative inferentialist structure. And what I just suggest here is if that is a problem, that circularity, of course the same thing is going to have to be the case as in the epistemic domain. Um, ultimately, we're going to need some kind of explanation of, of how we came to be beings that could have intentions, that is, have conceptual capacities. And as the quote from, and from um, more on givenness and explanatory framework of the question, how did we get into the epistemic framework, has a, or how did we come to possess these conceptual capacities, has a causal answer, a special application of evolutionary theory to the emergence of beings capable of conceptually representing the world and therefore having intentions and so on, and then we can give our account. But this isn't Seller's job as a philosopher, he doesn't think, to account for how we came to have linguistic conceptual capacities in the first place. Now, I will end actually there's one more thing I want to just say briefly to tie up. I mean, one final question then is whether um, the account of freedom and autonomy that Sellers has offered in the second half of the APA paper, has that introduced any conceptions of our agency that should be thought of as mysterious from a naturalistic perspective or a scientific perspective? Has, has Kant's conception of autonomy added anything from Sellers' reading that is somehow mysteriously beyond our evolved conceptual capacities for perception, inference, and volition that we are now sort of happily assuming ourselves to, to possess? Well, I think we've seen that intentions and volitions for Sellers are practically efficacious thoughts, that ceteris paribus give rise to the corresponding actions 
so conceived, and in that sense, such intentions are intrinsically or internally motivating. A genuinely autonomous villa or pure practical reason, in particular on Seller's reading, concerns our capacity to be motivated to action by a thought, the generic content of which, from the moral point of view, is not specifically about any of our particular ends or, or uh, interests in particular. Such a practically efficacious thought or pure idea of reason, if you will, is characterized by Kant as atemporal or supersensible in part. I'm not saying we can make Kant totally clean in all these respects or something that we can accept, but part of the reason he says it's atemporal or supersensible is because the content of that generic thought is non-empirical in the sense of being disinterested. And so it has no dependence on nothing. It's not about anything that has to do with temporal causal processes in itself. And also because in deliberating and acting from a motive, from that motive or point of view, I must practically presuppose, as Kant puts it, that my own generic thought or idea of reason is the sufficient, sufficient cause of my action. But I don't see that there needs to be anything mysterious about that from our perspective. Kant thinks that experience, in fact, shows that we do have the capacity to act both in conformity to, it can't explain it, but it can show that we have the capacity to act both in conformity to and in opposition to such a principle or motivating thought. And Kant contends that this is sufficient to assert our freedom without our being able to prove its metaphysical reality. And what the critique of speculative object metaphysics shows by Kant, I think, his critique of traditional metaphysics, is that the capacity for such an autonomously motivating thought or idea is not ruled out by anything we could ever come to know about nature scientifically. And that's, um, and this is what Sellers above called Kant's agnostic note that at least, quote, we cannot know on philosophical grounds that as Newman is, so to speak, we're not autonomous, unquote. And there are ways of reading Kant's transcendental idealism. I do some of it in my book on Kant that, that don't read things in themselves in ways that require commitments beyond a kind of radical turn toward the practical, which is what Kant intended the whole book to do in the first place. Or if one just cannot manage to see Kant himself entirely in this sweetly revolutionary practical light, then the alternative would be to leave transcendentalism, idealism behind, if that's one, how one thinks of it, and follow the pragmatists in pushing the regulative fallibilism of Kant's dialectic more strongly than Kant could have en envisioned. But my point is that either way, a Kantian empirical realism should be defended as real realism, as a naturally embodied realism within a comprehensively normative practical turn, and that Kant Kantian naturalist vision, I think, was the central message that Sellers intended his audience to take away in the 1970 uh, address. Thanks. Jim, thank you very much. That was actually hugely uh, um, um, enlightening to me. So uh, thank you for that. I I'm going to ask a question um, that isn't to the central points that you were making concerning uh, Sellers' interpretations of Kant and. Uh, um, uh, I want to ask a question that's that's more uh, came up on the one slide. It's the circularity point, and oh, it's yeah. the circularity point that I think uh, has been bothering a lot of us uh, in in reading sellers and maybe try to get some resolution to this. Um, so uh, it seems to be here's the circularity point. We need uh, in order to have uh, intentions at all, we need to be part of this community. Uh, people that already have we intentions, but how does the community get up and running? It's, it's it seems like a. a, a uh, a conceptual circularity. And uh, the answer that uh, you had sellers providing was, oh, well, look, we could tell a really neat um, causal story in evolutionary biological terms uh, that gets us to, oh, here is how creatures like this emerge. And to me, that seemed not uh, uh, an answer or not a responsive answer to the, um, uh, to the point, because I thought that the circularity point was a, a worry to the effect that any empirical causal evolutionary story cannot be told if the end point of that story has to be a, a, a community that, uh, it, it, it seemed like the circularity point was that any way of telling a causal story is gonna not be adequate. And so to say, oh, we can tell a really neat causal story is to dodge the, is to dodge the worry. I, I, I don't see how, yeah. how the, and I'm sure there is a neat causal story to be told as to how we got here, uh, but were that to be given, I don't see how the circularity point would be um, 
would be ameliorated or the circularity worry would be ameliorated. Yeah, I probably didn't say it correctly quite right. I tried to throw it in, but there's two components to his answer, I think. One of them typically is to say something fancy Kantian, philosophical, and then to say, but I recognize we have to explain how we got here with, with the, the one you called, the, sure, there's surely got to be some way to explain the evolution of language and so on. And I kind of left out. So in the epistemic domain, in moron givenness and explanatory coherence, also in the structure of knowledge, the um, um, and um, elsewhere, he'll sort of say, um, philosophically, we can give an account that what it is to know any world is going to have to, independent of us, is going to have to involve certain um, reliability principles principles where objects cause other objects to do various things. And he thinks we can articulate that um, you wouldn't know anything in particular unless you were in this general framework. He calls it theory T in, in um, more on givenness and explanatory knowledge. So he sort of philosophically takes on the, the tough task, as it were, of saying that general principles can be justified in this Kantian way. And I think he would try to do something similar with the the practical, um, although that might be where things get difficult. That might be the part I haven't talked about where Sellers tries to say, how do we, how do we show that there have to be these normative principles for any rational being? And he talks about Peirce's valiant effort to show any knowing being has to, has to uh, any being that has um, knowledge has to have certain normative principles at work. But so. Although I think it would probably be something more about pointing to what he said about autonomy that says if we're going to be the sort of uh, agents that are responsible for what we do, then this is the kind of efficacious thinking we have to be able to do. And general normative principles are reflections of that capacity, right? But I think he would say, of course, I, you know, then he would make the same gesture to say uh, all that takes place within the conceptual domain, and he would grant that there's a sense in which we've got to explain where conceptual <coughs> capacities came from. And that's the point where I think he just says the evolution of language somehow is the account of how we came about to have signs that had general import, you know, and he's not in the business of giving that last account. Mm. So something like that is, but it's a difficult question how to break out of that. Thank you. Mark. Jim, thanks for the paper. I, I don't know Sellers well. Um, one of the things that struck me in your account of um, his sort of reconstruction of the Kantian practical philosophy, and in particular the idea of oughts as intentions, was the distance that seems to be between that and the kind of necessitation that's involved, uh, that I think of as associated with Kantian ought in, in practice and the notion of duty and so forth. Um, so I'm curious as to whether or not you see necessitation as being something that gets chucked overboard to bring the rest of Kant into uh, a naturalistically acceptable framework by Sellers Lights, or if there's a different account of necessitation, or you know, or, or whether it's not attended to, where, where that might fit in Sellers reconstruction of what's going on there. Yeah, I mean, think of Kant on it as well, so that there's a sense of necessitation if you if you think on what the right thing to do is then as it were there's a form of necessitation in, in the the obligation is it's a self-imposed obligation there's going to be a right thing to do which will fit that law there's, but there's also whether you do it or not so I picture sellers saying in the cool hour where we're wondering should I act to satisfy my happiness or out of a principle of benevolence or should I act on the thought that we've all, let us all do this in principle, not lie, not whatever it is, um, that the same sort of thing occurs. There's the, it, it, there's no necessitation that you're going to do the right thing, right? So where the necessitation is that the thought of doing the right thing is the thought of acting in just those ways, which are the way we all will act when we're doing the right thing. So that, I guess that's how it, there's the same structure as in Kant on that, I guess I would say. So the necessitation, as it were, is if you, if, if you do 
you are of a character that lets the thought of of what we should the impartial thought motivate your actions. To be a good character is to be the sort of person where your what follows in your actions is what that thought necessitates. But but whether that is the case depends on on which one. Um, this is why I like W. D. Falk on, on the you know, it, it, it's it's which consideration you let be efficacious in, in your in, in your own inner life. Yes. Thanks for the question. Further questions? As you were speaking, I was, um, when it seemed like, the, is there any worry that you're packing in some things in the, trans, in the transcendental unity of apperception kind of part of Kant? Um, it seemed like, well, we can't stick it in these, some of these organizing ideas and that kind of thing um, can't be stuck in the other, <laughs> the agent I or the empirical I, and so I'm going to, you know, or Kant does, um, put them in the transcendental unity of that perception, which uh, is a convenient place to put things because we don't know what the heck that is. Um, well, well, and so well, are you worried that, that, like, you know, hey, if I can't figure out other places to stick it, we'll, we'll part it, put it as part of the transcendental unity of that perception, right. and whether that, in a way, is kind of a, a questionable move. Right, so the idea is supposed to be, we do know what the transcendental unity of that perception is, and it turns out what that unity is is not the unity of a certain thing or object right. or substance, right? So what is it? Well, it's in when you grow up, you're learning a language, you're learning to carve up the world into things that persist independently of your, your as it were, becoming a self, because it's the, it's the whole intentional structure of our thought about the world as independent of us that's at the same time what it is to have a grip on yourself as a experiencer of that world. It's, you know, the, a psychological reflection of this might be the thought experiments about... Um, not thought experiments, psychological experiments about when kids get a concept of the self and, right. and, and when they, that it seems to track along with when they begin to get a concept of objects as, as having natures independently, as being seen by other people and so on. But that's a psychological analog. But the Kant's philosophy was, what's a self? A self's a certain um, unity. Well, what's, what is the unity? Yeah. It's in being able to say, I was thinking so and so. It's the, it's the personal pronoun I, I and the role that it plays in attributing your thoughts and experience to yourself. And so I'm trying to see it as not mysterious in that way, but it's the unity in a, in a, in a form of thinking, not the representation of a thing or stuff. So it's right. more like a narrative, intentionalist view of the unity of the self or a Donetian view of the self. But it's, it's um, so I, I, I like to think that that's not unknown or implausible, right. and we know the empir it's fully embodied in our empirical nature. It's not reducible to it, but not because it's a thing that's not reducible right. to it. That's, that's, that. that's okay. the idea. Further questions or comments? I'm, uh, Ross. I want to suggest a probably very cheap uh, response to David's concern. Um, can't, uh, with regard to circularity, yeah. um, can't we just say circularity, the, the circularity concern uh, sits in the manifest image, causal concern sits in the scientific image, non -re uh, manifest image is non-reducible to the scientific image, therefore we don't have a problem. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking I wouldn't think of it that way, because I think of the scientific image as integrated with, I mean, the you know where he says, look, this, the manifest image doesn't get overwhelmed by the, the scientific image. So how doesn't it get overwhelmed? It's because all these normative principles, persons, if you're going to have concepts, you've got normative principles. The whole, the whole shebang is there in this supposed idealized scientific image as well. It's just that the object ontology, Sellers has his relocation argument and his scientific advancement arguments that he thinks the objects have to be radically reconceived. But I, I, I think it's a mistake to, to think that all of the things I've been saying, I think Sellers envisioned them as fully in play in what he called the ideal synoptic vision. Yeah. Um, uh, what your talk 
brought to mind a, a section from uh, the third critique, yeah. um, which anyone who's taught, been unfortunate enough to sit next to me or something around here has heard me rave about the third critique. Um, um, in just before section 354 in the uh, critique aesthetic judgment, I think this section, may, it makes me think of what you're talking about with regards to the basis for f this freedom, um, the reading back into the into uh, Kant's earlier stuff, this kind of thing. It's um, is it all right if I just read yeah, it? Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Uh, in this ability, uh, taste. This is an addition by the translator. Uh, judgment does not find itself subjected to a heteronomy from empirical laws, as it does elsewhere in empirical judging. Concerning objects of such a pure liking, it legislates to itself just as reason does regard to the power of desire. And because the subject has this possibility within him, while outside of him there is also the possibility that nature will harmonize with it, judgment finds itself referred to something that is both in the subject himself and outside him, something that is neither nature nor freedom, and yet is linked with the basis of freedom, the supersensible, in which the theoretical and the practical power are in an unknown manner combined and joined into a unity. Um, I'll stop there. He goes on and yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, it's when the, there's a certain extent to which my Kant is going to be deflated a little bit with 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 the God stuff. It's yeah. so. I mean, but so. What we know for Kant is freedom. Uh, we don't quite have a, a metaphysical explanation of it, and I think Sellers gives you this account of of thinking yeah. as autonomous, which can domesticate what that kind of freedom is. Now. Um, so, the, I think the third critique, then, um, in the introductions to the third critique, says, um, you've argued that we've got all these categories that have to be applied. How are they applied? And it turns out they're only applied if there are empirical laws and natural uniformities of various kinds, but you can't legislate a priori which ones you're going to discover. But you're warranted in thinking of nature as open to the discovery of empirical, you have to think of nature that way in general. It's as if in the philosophy of science where you have um, principles of, back, some background principles of simplicity, of, of uh, more loose investigative principles, those things are objectively valid, I think, for, for, Kant, for Kant. The reason he says that they're regulative is because you, you can't constitute a priori what kinds of systematicity there's going to be, but it's a constitutive principle that there is empirical, well, now what God sums up is nature as maximally purposive. That's different from what I think Kant actually thinks you can show in one sense, is that Kant, nature must be at least minimally purposive if we're to have knowledge of it. And then reason kicks in to, to want a maximal representation of that but it's not like you can prove that there's a maximal systematicity. But, but when you have that idea, you start thinking of nature as intelligible in the way it presents itself to us contingently, then he thinks aesthetics can fall in, in, in to line with that. That is, nature seems like as if it was made for us to know it in its contingent empirical systematicity. And, and um, so I think those views can, when he talks about the super sensible, that is, respects pertaining to freedom, to regular maxim, maxims about nature's order, and God is a kind of sum up of those aspects of intelligibility that with regard to the maximum, you can't really prove it, but it, it, it uh, guides our historical and, and moral endeavors. Yeah, I, uh, is, okay. I am um, curious, something, uh, because, yeah, of course, the God problem, God hooks all this together for him. Without it, it doesn't really make much, purposiveness doesn't make much sense. Well, well, well be careful, because Kant doesn't explain per nature's yeah. purposiveness in terms of God, right? You get, yeah. You get that nature is intrinsically purposive. In fact, he explicitly rejects the purposes of the of nature being explained by God. Yeah. He thinks even Aquinas rejected that. It's, it's nature is intrinsically purposive, but only regulatively known in that way, because minimally it okay. better have some empirical systematicity, yeah. or there's what we can prove that the categories wouldn't be applicable.
Yeah, well, in some kind of, he, he pushes for some kind of rational, it's almost as if uh, there, because this is, um, nature is um, accessible to our rational faculties, there had to be some kind of rational faculty in the beginning that made nature possible. I, I, I could swear he almost says that there was a mind. Well, but you can see yeah. how I'm, I'm chilling that out a yeah. little bit because I think what he thinks you can actually show is, is not proof that there's a, uh, a mind that yeah. created it all. What you can show is that for our kind of knowledge to be possible, nature has to be thought as um, 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 empirically systematized in some not leg a priori legislatable way, but that we'll explore and discover in its contingent. He says there might not be any unified laws of physics, he says, somewhere in the introduction yeah. of the third critique, and we might discover this, that, and the other thing. But if it's total chaos, you can prove that then you wouldn't even have the sorts of knowledge that we categorically can show we have to have if we're to have any knowledge of the world at all. And so, so I think when you bring in re freedom's ideas, Kant does think he can give this proof of, you know, the postulate of God's existence as making justice work out. But you know, whether he even himself believes that bad argument. <laughs> I think we'll leave it with Kant's bad arguments, and uh, thank you very much.